one of our more important um, city chats. Because the, the thing is that you can't do anything with city if you don't have any money. And one of the things that I learned really quick as being the mayor, um, the two people that I spend a lot of time talking to is my finance director and my lawyer. You know, so <laughs> those two people keep me control. But what's so important about this is that there's things that we do you know, from accounting point of view, usually most often people have questions about why can we do something or not do something. It all comes back to the different points. And Angie's the expert on that. And then we have um, uh, a person talk about bonds. And the reason why we're talking about bonds is that if, if in my mind, if the city's going to do some big project, we're not going to be able to um, do it out of cash flow. We're going to have to take out loans. And unfortunately, our city has done very well of paying cash as we go. Um, so we really haven't done that for, I think the LIB was the last big finance that we did. Um, but anyway, to explain it, um, two big projects that, that we're looking at that possibly that we would be asking the citizens about uh, um, taking out a bond is going to be uh, the police station and um, our South Fire Station. So those are the two that are on the docket. Everything else that we're working on right now is probably out of cash flow or out of grants. Um, but with that, um, I'm going to turn it over uh, to Angie. And, uh, and the idea is we're going to do the presentation. And there'll be questions that you have. Um, we're going to record this. So if your friends didn't make it here, hopefully they can see it. But again, I think finance is probably one of the biggest things that I, as the mayor, have to deal with. because. We can do anything if we've got the money. Um, that's going to be the challenge of finding the money, and Angie's the one that helps me do that. Angie? Thank you, John. So um, I will do a little presentation. I was trying to memorize my notes, and then I learned that I could use them. So I will use them. They have some data and some information in there. I was asked to speak on a few points, so I'll make sure to cover those. And then once I'm done, I'll hand it over to Dave to talk about some debt um, items, and then we'll open it up for questions at the end. So uh, I wanted to start off by saying that yesterday was my six year anniversary with the city. Um, I feel like that might be a record, I'm not sure, but I'm gonna do some research, and if it is, I feel like I need a plaque for my wall or something. <laughs> um, so this time six years ago, Steve would had me in his That's office record. on record. day two training me. So I uh, wanted to get that out there first. Um, prior to that, I was with the state auditor's office for 14 years. Um, during my time with the auditor's office, I saw the city at its lowest point. Um, I saw the city when I did an audit, you know, back during the recession. This was one of the governments um, in my four county region. I audited all the governments in four counties. And this was the only one that I potentially thought was a going concern, which meant that I didn't know if the city would be financially sustainable for another year. So those were some difficult conversations that we had to have. Um, I remember meeting um, with city administration back at that time, and um, they sat down, they came up with a plan. There was so much debt. There were so many interphone loans. There was little money in the bank. Um, you name it, there was just a lot of problems. We had issues with the cost allocation. But sat down with the city, made a plan, and every year I came back after that, it just got better and better. And that's contributed a lot to Steve, so I want to say thank you for that. He left me a great legacy. Thank you, Steve. Kind of nice. <laughs> uh, so, uh, with all that said, you know, today I think it's probably the highest uh, point we've ever had at the city with um, how much debt we've paid off, with our assessed valuation. Um, record-breaking hotel motel and sales tax numbers every month um, it's just been great to see and that's due to years of financially responsible decisions and obviously our continued just record-breaking growth out here so my goal as the finance director um, is just to continue down that path to always make sound financial recommendations to both city administration and city council Try to give you the best advice I have and then hopefully teach people um, how the finances work and try to help guide those decisions in the best way forward for the city. So with that, uh, what do I do in finance? 
basically, I like to say anything with a dollar assigned attached to it is something that touches our office. So we receive all of the money for the city, we pay all of the city's bills, and we try to keep the city out of trouble um, in doing so. <laughs> so we have our annual audits, which we just went through and got another clean audit report, so that was nice. Um, so there's a lot of things that we touch in finance. Um, most of the time you see me publicly, it's during the budget. Um, so you'll see me quite a bit this summer when we start our budget for 2023 and 2024. And then I basically take over the council meetings for about six months and we just work on the budget. Um, the mayor specifically asked me today to talk about how local government accounting works. And I, I got a comment right when I walked in the door, like it would be nice to have just kind of an overview on how this works. Um, so we do a two-year budget. Um, we have 43 funds, um, and our 2021-2022 budget contains appropriations of $71 million. So it's, it's a big budget. Um, we have a lot of stuff going on. We have a lot of funds to manage. Um, the city's general fund is obviously the largest. It contains 21 general government departments, um, some of them police, fire, finance, um, our attorney, um, City Hall, City Executive. Um, the revenue source, the biggest revenue source for the general fund is taxes. Um, taxes are 62% of what makes up the general fund revenue. And taxes come from property taxes, sales taxes, utility taxes, etc. cetera. Um, the nice thing about the general fund is it can be used for anything. It has no legal restrictions on it, which will kind of segue into these next conversations we have. Um, we also have some other funds. We have reserve funds that have been set up, council emergency fund. We have a new ARCHA fund that was set up to kind of isolate those funds so we can be very transparent with what's going in and what's going out. Um, we have debt funds, we have capital funds, we have enterprise funds, which are also known as utility funds. Um, lately, I think we've had the most attention put on our utility or enterprise funds. Um, the storm drain has had a couple rate increases in the last couple years. We have not had enough money in there to do what we need to do. So the last couple of years, our public works director has asked for increases to start doing more projects um, in the storm drain and starting to build a base for better um, operations and projects going forward. Um, the other big one that we've been talking about quite a bit is the EMS fund and the need for additional staffing in that fund. Um, I was asked to talk a little bit about that today because it seems to be the hottest topic out there right now. Um, when we talk about these utility funds, um, they're meant to be self-sustaining. So basically, your revenues should, con should cover your operating expenses as well as any future or current capital needs. Um, we have four of them. You see them on your utility bills. We have the EMS or ambulance, water, sewer, and storm. And because the enterprise funds or utility funds are meant to be self-sustaining, the council has the ability to set the rates for those funds. Um, the rates should be set to ensure the sustainability, which includes operation, payroll, is our biggest number in that, as well as any future capital project needs that come down the line for water or sewer or any of them. Um, so, Rate studies are pretty critical when figuring out what to set those rates at, what our operational and capital needs are. Um, we currently have two rate studies we're working on, one for the EMS, the ambulance, as well as one for water. And we also have one budgeted for the storm fund that we'll hopefully start working on at some point soon. Um, I always get the question, why don't we just use general fund money to pay for utility functions instead of having to do rate increases? Well, um, the answer is we can legally. Um, however, the general fund does not have the ability to just raise rates to provide service. So like I said before, um, general fund, 62% of it is made up of taxes and council has very limited um, power and what they can do with taxes. We're set by state requirements with property taxes, sales taxes is just, you get what you get um, based on the activity out here. So it's not something we can really control. Um, so when people ask me that, I say, uh, 
we can't generate additional revenue for the general fund. So if you want to add additional costs, what of the 21 general government services do you want to look at cutting? Um, for example, this has been the hottest topic, so I'm using this as an ex example, but we had a, an EMS rate study done back in 2017. And based on that, which I'm going to say is outdated data, we are trying to get a new one, should be done this spring. But um, to fund the current request of 30 firefighters, uh, we would need an additional 2 million more per biennium. So if we took that out of the general fund, um, which I'm asked repeatedly if we can do that, my response would be, okay, well, what are we going to cut? We have the police. It's $4.5 million for the biennium. We have code enforcement. It's $366,000. We have the library. It's $812,000. And the library, you remember back when I first started, we made a commitment to the library to pull it into the general fund and not do an additional levy for that every three years. Um, and in order to do that, we had to stop giving general fund money to the ambulance fund so that we could sustain the library and the general fund. So it's all this matter of, if you move more expenses in the general fund, you're gonna have to take something out because we can't just keep adding revenue to that fund. Another example I was asked to provide is, what if we did add the two million and got up to 30 firefighters? What would that look like for the fire and EMS in comparison to the general fund budget? So ransom numbers, um, basically if we add another two million, we already have two million in the general fund for fire. We have 7.3 million in EMS. That would bring the total fire and EMS budget up to 11.3 million. So when you compare that to all of the general fund government departments, the 21 of them I mentioned earlier, that would be 63%. So it's a pretty big number. And I think people wanted to me to point that out that it's, you know, adding that many makes that number just continue to grow and grow. Um, another common question. Why can't we just use the general fund surplus? Um, well, it's not sustainable. Um, luckily, the city has had um, kind of a pattern of using that surplus money for one-time um, expenses. We've been doing a lot of debt repayment with it. We've also been setting aside a lot of money for capital projects. Um, I would never recommend that we put operational costs that we know are going to be ongoing year after year and use surplus money to pay for that because you don't know if we're gonna to continue to have a surplus. So that would leave us in a spot where we hire all these people, run out of surplus, don't have any way to fund it, and then we're laying them off. So it just wouldn't be a financial a responsible decision to do that. So I guess the bottom line is, um, just because we can use the general fund for everything doesn't necessarily mean it's a wise or responsible financial choice for us. Um, Again, if you add more expenses, you're going to have to cut things out. So then it becomes, what do we cut? Parks, library, police. I mean, there's just 21 of them that we'd have to consider. Um, again, just reiterating that the intent of the utility is to be self-sustaining. That's why the council can set the rates. Um, we can't use those utility rates for anything other than the intended purpose. So the EMS the rates that you pay on your utility bill have to be used for EMS. We can't use them for the convention center or any other fund. It has to be used for that. It's against the law for us to do um, use those for other purposes. Um, with that being said, I just wanted to point out we're going to, the EMS is going to continue to be a conversation that we're going to have. Like I mentioned, we're hoping to have that study back um, hopefully within the next month or so. They are putting the final touches on the data and trying to schedule meetings with us. So uh, I think we're all committed to having a plan going forward. We realize we need additional staffing. It's just making sure we have a sustainable revenue source to fund it going forward and that we don't have to risk our other general government services to cover that. So, um, And then um, I think that's about it for my presentation. Um, you're going to see a lot of me, like I said, this summer when we start the budget. Um, I know we're going to gear up for that probably. Get a budget calendar out around June or July. And then um, I think that kind of wraps up my Government Accounting 101 piece. And I'll turn it over to Dave for his bond presentation. Thank you, Angie. Hopefully you can hear me okay. Okay. 
Okay. Um, I'm Dave Tragesser, Managing Director with DA Davidson, and I also have seen a lot of the highs and lows of the city. I've worked for the city for about 30 years on bond financing, and I'm gonna, I've been asked to put together a little 101 uh, on bonds, how the process, look at the bond market, look at some options for financing for different projects. I have it on the screen up here, but I think it's going to be hard to see some of the information there. So I know we have there's some hard copies back here, and I'd encourage you to make sure you have the hard copy as I go through it. Uh, that way we can answer your questions if you may have any. Um, so first of all, um, there are a variety of different types of bond issues the city can issue, and the city has issued many of these over the years. And um, uh, they are either classified as tax exempt or taxable. Typically, most of the bonds are going to be tax exempt, which means they comply with the federal tax code. The city promises not to do anything that would make them taxable over the life of the bonds. And that, by getting bonds issued on a tax exempt basis, they provide the lowest borrowing cost, either a fixed rate or variable rate. The city can issue a variety of different types of bonds, first of which are what we call limited tax general obligation bonds. These are non-voted bonds the county or the city council can issue by itself. Um, statutorily, they can only issue up to 1.5% of their tax base or assessed valuation for any type of non-voted tax, uh, tax bond. But the city does not have very many bonds outstanding currently on a non-voted basis. And so and the tax base has grown dramatically over the last number of years, which we'll be talking about later. So there is significant statutory capacity if the city ever decides to issue calcimatic bonds. Secondly, the, the, the city, like many other municipalities, like the school district or other folks, you can go to the voters for uh, general obligation bond financing. That's called a limited tax general obligation bond. That also is a full faith and credit of the city. But the good thing from that perspective is that if you get the super majority, uh, which is a 60% requirement for the voters, and you have a 40% turnout, that's the benchmark for voted bonds, you get the excess levy to pay off the debt service of the bonds. For councilmanic bonds, the first option above issued by the, the city council, the debt service needs to be paid from existing sources. They have a variety of sources they can pay them from, but that's the difference. Additionally, the city can issue revenue bonds. Many cities issue water, sewer, store, revenue bonds where they pledge just the revenues from those specific enterprise funds to make debt service payments for the bonds. Those don't count towards the city's uh, general obligation capacity. And the city has historically done that as well. However, when you issue revenue bonds, the city needs to demonstrate sufficient cash flow to show debt service coverage, that they have enough cash flow in those that respective utility to make the debt service payment on the bonds. And it also comes with different covenants or promises to bondholders that they will continually provide that cash flow for the debt service on the bonds. The city also has issued local improvement district bonds, which are secured solely by the benefit of properties within a specific local improvement district. Um, uh, typically the borrowing cost for local improvement district bonds is, is higher because of the, uh, of the security is considered less than the bond market than the other bond options that we talked about. But the city would have access to any of these potential financing options for a respective project if the council decides to move forward. Um, all these bonds can be issued on a long-term fixed rate basis or on a variable rate basis. Additionally, not shown on this page, is the city can do a variety of what we call interim financing, short-term financing for any of those projects, whether they be general obligation revenue or local improvement district back. Typically, those short-term financings are done as a line of credit, also can be done tax exempt, and provide flexibility to, to do projects on a quick basis if need be to, to provide funds on that basis. Oop, gosh, fast with the fingers here. Um, bonds 
are sold in the marketplace and in the private market. And the city has done this in a variety of different ways. So if bonds are sold on the public market, typically uh, this is for larger bond issues and bond issues that are have a longer maturity of the bonds. There is a bond rating application made, a significant amount of disclosure put together for bond investors. That's done in a document called a preliminary official statement, similar to a prospectus, if you're familiar with that on the corporate finance side. And uh, once we get an investment grade rating from one of the rating agencies, bonds can be marketed nationwide to a low market clearing rate. Um, and, that's, and the city has done that for typically bond issues that are at least three to four million dollars or more, and you're borrowing for at least 15 years. Um, if, if the bond issue is small, and if the bond issue is going to be paid off in a shorter period of time, the city often will issue the bond and place it with a sophisticated investor. And that's called a private placement. Typically, community banks and financial institutions are the direct purchasers of those bonds. And the advantage of that is that it's typically quicker, faster, and easier. There's no ongoing disclosure requirements that public bonds have, so it's easier for the finance department to handle. And uh, the process, as I mentioned, takes 10 weeks instead of at least three months. So it's, uh, uh, and we've done that uh, for a water sewer project, as I recall, not just like four or five years ago. And uh, th that is a very active market. In the Northwest, there are you know, 15 direct purchasers of bonds for, on a private placement basis at least. And so there, it's a competitive process. We put together a RFP, a request for proposal, sent out, the banks respond to it, and we usually take the lowest net borrowing cost based on the conditions that they provide in their, in their bids. So those are the two methods for the sale of the bonds. When bonds are issued, we look at a variety of different factors. Uh, in addition, not just the, the, the project being financed, but how long will the uh, spend down requirements be? In other words, you have to, the city has to uh, have a reasonable expectation that they can spend the proceeds within a, a three-year period, 85% of the bond proceeds, issue bonds tax exempt. And also there's a term called bank qualified. What that means is there's a federal um, uh, requirement that if the city issues less than $10 million of bonds in a calendar year, tax that bonds, they get to designate those bonds as quote, bank qualified. And if the bonds are des so designated, financial institutions have an incentive to purchase the bonds. And because of that incentive, they're willing to accept a lower interest rate. So we evaluate, you know, during a calendar year, can we issue less than $10 million of bonds uh, to keep them bank qualified to, to get that lowest borrowing cost? And to give you an example, in today's market, if the city issues uh, bonds that are not bank qualified, the interest rate, depending on the maturity, would be about 2.8%. If they're bank qualified, it'd be like 2.5%. So there's a, that doesn't sound like a lot of money, but when you're talking $10 million over a long period of time, it generates a lot of money. Um, the third planning item I have down here is what we call a reimbursement resolution. And so I mentioned that we need to comply with federal tax law for all the bonds to be tax exempt. One of these areas relates to if the city decides to spend their own money for a capital project initially, and then issue tax exempt bonds at a later date. An example would be if they needed to acquire a piece of property and then they're gonna build a building on it. If they use their own cash to buy the land, um, to, they may want to refinance that in a tax exempt bond later when they decide to build the building. And the federal tax rule says you need to pass a reimbursement resolution by the council. It's just a, it's a, it's a paper document, it's a one pager, it's very simple, but once that's passed, the city would have the ability to issue tax exempt bonds down the road for a project that they're currently working on. Financial management policies are one part of the credit evaluation. No matter how bonds are issued, 
the, the markets and the financial institutions evaluate the city's credit. And one part of that are the policies that the city may have uh, to promote fiscal integrity and provide uh, uh, continuity over time. So I, I listed some key strengths of the policy down here. Unrestricted cash goal, monthly reporting, quarterly reporting, long-term uh, financial forecast, multi-year capital facility planning. The city does a lot of this. And so as part of the documents, when we put a bond deal together, we go through and document a lot of this. And the more credit strengths we have, the better the credit and the lower the borrowing cost. I'll be talking a little bit more about this in a minute. So well, this will show very well that um, when bonds are sold in the public markets, typically we go to a bond rating agency, which is a third party agency to review the credit. It can be either Standard Poor's uh, or Moody's Investor Service. The rating, the higher the rating, the lower the borrowing cost. And a lot of these credit factors are noted here on this page, which is a little harder to see on this page. But it's debt factors, economy, financial performance, and management factors. And all those go together to determine the rating. Many of these are out, out of outside the control of the city. The economy, for example, you can't control the economy. You can control your finances and some of your management factors, but you can't control the economy. And the economy is one of the biggest factors that goes into the bond rating. Currently, as noted in, on this page, the city has an A-plus standard poor's rating. This was last affirmed back in 2016. I'll get into that in a minute. That's a high, medium investment grade rating. It's a good rating. The city is the only rated city in Grace Harbor County. Um, I'll be talking about that in a minute. Now, here's the page that you can't read on the screen, <laughs> but it should be in your book. So this is an example of bond ratings in Washington State. There are 281 uh, incorporated municipalities in Washington, but only 90 have ratings. Many people don't get a rating because they're not borrowing money. They don't need it necessarily a rating. But uh, there are currently 90 ratings that are listed here by county. You can go through them and look at them at your convenience. The city is the only rated uh, city in Grace Harbor County with your A+. Plus. Um, ratings vary from, you know, BAA or, or single A up to AAA, which is the highest rating. There are only a handful of AAA rated cities in Washington. You can see them on this page. You know, there's Seattle, they're Bellevue, they're high, big cities, but there's also a few smaller cities that um, in, in, in the Puget Sound area, like Kenmore or Lacey just got upgraded to AAA. Little town of Woodway is AAA rated. A lot of that has to do with the wealth factors in this, and diversification in the cities. Uh, the city was last reviewed six years ago. And a um, popular report is here if anybody wants to dig deep into the city's credit. Uh, <laughs> this is the A plus. They were, uh, they were affirmed back then with a stable outlook back in 2016. The city today looks much different than it did six years ago. Um, for example, the tax base has grown 94% <laughs> since this rating was issued um, and a number of other uh, positive things. But even back then, they talked about um, strong budgetary performance of the city, strong budgetary flexibility, strong liquidity, rapid amortization, how you're paying off the debt. That has continued in mass. The city has paid off a lot of debt in the last six years. Um, they do have a couple suggestions that we're talking about. Those going forward about uh, you know reserve requirements and, and, and the like. But um, it's good to have this outstanding rating. The rating agencies do what we call surveillance. In other words, uh, typically They'll go in and call the city every year or two and get updates on financial performance and, and sometimes provide updates to these reports. However, because the city is an, in, is an infrequent issuer and small issuer, they haven't done that in quite a number of years. So we expect that depending on if we do decide to go back to the bond market and go back for a public offering, we'll be going back to uh, S&P standard pours 
and make a lot of positive credit points about the differences between 2016 and today for the city. One thing I'll just point out in this report, it's on the very back, and it's, at, it's under the Outlook section. It goes right by it, but <laughs> it says, should the city's economy continue to show improvement with increases in assessed value, which it has, and income levels, falling unemployment, uh, the, the, uh, improving its financial management score, which has to do with those uh, policies and procedures, the rating could be raised. Typically, they have a two-year outlook on their ratings, and so we're way past that, and so we're, we'll be making a pitch to the S&P going forward. Whoa. So, uh, S&P didn't know the stable, stable financial performance, how they've been updating their CIP, and they'd like to uh, talk about a minimum general fund reserve, which the city can achieve going forward. So those are some of the key discussion points we'd be having uh, with S&P on the next round. I was also asked to talk about the bond market in general. Um, what we've got here is a five-year history of our bond market for high-rated, double-A-rated municipal bonds. And uh, this is a, uh, as I mentioned, a five-year history. You can see how it's gone down there. That's 2020. That's when the pandemic hit. We hit 40-year lows in uh, the bond market. And those lows maintained themselves for almost two years. They were a little up and down. You may see there on the far right that uptick there, and that occurred over the last two months, and it has to do with rising inflation, <laughs> the Fed rate increases, which they're, you know, they've announced uh, going forward. So that put a jolt in our market in the last, the last two months. The borrowing cost has gone up, maybe like three tenths, four tenths, and one percent for fixed rate bonds. However, not shown in this graph is what happened over the last four days because of the war in Ukraine. I, I work in a kind of a perverse world. Bad news is good news for the bond market and good news for borrowers like the city. So when we had the Ukraine problem, the war, there's what we call a flight to quality. In other words, investors around the world don't know what to do. But what, when, when war happens, what they do do is they buy U.S. Treasury bonds because they know that's the one thing in the world that's safe in an uncertain world. And so when all that money from around the world goes into U.S. Treasury bonds during a war, it helps our taxes and bond market as well because they're going into fixed income, high-rated securities, which is what our bond market is. And so if, you had a, if I updated this over the last week, you'd see that last one go down about halfway again. So. Um, the city, when they do issue bonds, whether it's a month from now, six months from now, or a year from now, they go into the bond market for the market at that time. So the borrowing cost will be determined based on market conditions at that time on the issue bonds. What I've done on this page is a lot of details of the bond market. And it's hard to, hard to see here, but there's three graphs. The first graph, is a 10-year history of what we call the 20-year uh, municipal market data, which is highly rated bonds. And then the second one is the 10-year maturity. And the bottom one's a one-year maturity. The takeaway from this is the short-term borrowings have seen the most volatility, the most up and down of borrowing because of the Fed rate increases and the like. So uh, even though long-term rates have come up a little bit in the last few months, we're still not far from 40-year lows in the bond market. Um, we had a Zoom call, I'm trying to remember how long ago that was, it was probably two months. two months ago, and we were talking about different potential, you know, financings, whether they be fire improvements, uh, police station, city hall improvements, can I issue LTGO by that, that means limited tax general obligation, which means non-voted council manic bonds, and so we've been just talking about potentials 
down the road looking at numbers and the like for something like that. We also have continued to evaluate the refinancing of the convention center bonds. We refinanced those in 2014 for debt service savings. But I've shown in my graph, rates have even come down further since then. So we're, that is on the docket too for evaluation if we can generate sufficient uh, net debt service savings. So um, all three of those are, are being considered for discussion purposes. A timeline for bonds. So, depending on if, the, if it's small financing, remember I mentioned the term private placement, that process takes about nine weeks. Um, if we do a public offering, it, it takes at least 10 weeks to 12 weeks to do that. Under any example of, of bond financing, we need to go to the council. The council needs to approve a delegation ordinance for that. For that. Uh, issuance of bonds. And under a delegation ordinance, the authority to issue the bonds could be delegated to the mayor or staff under certain parameters. All the parameters would be in the ordinance. That would typically include the maximum borrowing amount, the purpose, the maximum maturity of the bonds, and the maximum interest rates. And so uh, if council approves that document, approves the ordinance, then the staff and uh, us would work towards finalizing the timing and the access to the bond market, locking in the interest rates, and then actually closing a bond issue. And typically for a bond issue, once the closing date's established, that all the proceeds are paid from bondholders to the city. The city would then invest those proceeds over the draw schedule for the project. So we. We go through and try to maximize any interest earnings on the proceeds until bond, pro until bond proceeds are expended. The other participant in the financing is a uh, bond council to obtain tax exempt bond proceeds. We need a legal opinion from a recognized bond council stating in their opinion the bonds are valid, legal, binding, and have complied with all state and federal requirements for the issuance of the bonds. So that's the other member of the finance team. Um, and with that, that's my presentation um, of the bond process. And I'd be glad to answer any questions you may have about bond financing. Your presentation made me want to go get a new bond rating. <laughs> um, you're going to do the questions, okay? Um, so there's a lot of stuff that's covered off. Um, a lot of this, a lot of, a lot of the things as far as projects go, there's a lot of work that has to be done by the council and bring it before to have a discussion. So just because you saw three items that we're talking about doesn't mean that we made the decision to move forward. But to move forward, the biggest question I've got to answer as mayor is how am I going to pay for it with it? So that was one of the reasons why that we're out in front having the conversations, what our options are. Um, we'll have further discussions in the budget as we as we go through. But um, so that being said, you've got some experts here and especially Angie that could probably answer the questions better. Uh, on where we are financially than probably I can. So, do you have questions? Put your off. Steve Ensley. And so, my question is just based on what you just said, it implies that we got to wait until the budget's done to do anything. And I would suggest that. I don't want to wait that long to make those decisions so that uh, the decision to to do some of these projects can be done this year um, and, and then the budget that you put out will reflect whatever those decisions have, have been made. So I, I just wanted to be clear that is that what you're thinking? Uh, at this point in time? Well, what I was thinking is the first thing that we would move forward is the South Fire Station. Oh. 
Um, now we run into a little bit of roadblock because staffing would be part of that discussion, not from a, a bond point of view, but just a, as a financing. So we're working through that part at first, but that was the original plan to come before the council and talk to them about options if we were going to move forward to finance it. Uh, we have a plan to bring forward our proposal on the police station, which will have much more more discussion. And our plan is probably in the next couple months, we want to move forward on the tsunami tower first, as far as the approval to get there. Now, the tsunami tower, we're not looking for doing any bonds on the tsunami tower. We've got we've got grants and money for that. But the plan is to move forward. Um, I was hoping to have a decision from the council. Um, on the fire station, uh, you know, doing the pre presentation before we even started the, the budgeting process. But obviously, if I if we build it, but we can't staff it, there's an issue with it. So that's kind of we're uh, we're just we're just waiting on that. But but no, I don't have any intention to actually stop slow down the conversation because I think that's why we're talking about it tonight to have the citizens start understanding of what we're thinking about so there's no surprises yeah and I'd like to speak a little bit about that as well they um the south fire station we do have money in the budget currently for that um, unfortunately it's not enough so kind of some of the data I've been pulling is can we afford to add money to the budget and just pay cash should we do a direct re direct placement um, which is one of the easier ones that he was talking about that's quicker um, so those are options that we need to bring forward um, to City Council. It's just a matter of timing and when the mayor's ready to bring those forward. This one you may not know the answer to, but in the 301 capital fund, the general general funds capital fund, how much of that is um, available? Um, I know some of it is designated for specific things. The tsunami tower has a, has a bunch of it, as, as, as I recall. Mm -hmm. Do you have any feel for how much is in that fund? Don't quote me. I think it's around 400000 but we are. That's not like earmarked for other things. However, we are bringing a library siding project to council at the first meeting in March for about 125 I thought, yeah. So it's that'll make a li another little dent yeah. in it. Um, for the South Fire Station, we were talking about whether, because we have it currently in the budget as a 50-50 split between general fund and EMS, um, obviously the general fund can afford that. The EMS fund, we'd be driving that fund balance quite a bit below our target per our financial policy. But again, that's going to be something for council to decide if they're comfortable with that or if we want to go out and do a debt issuance for it instead. So. We have been doing the behind the scenes on the South Fire Station. It just kind of, with the tsunami tower, we've had the library, we have um, uh, the crosswalks coming up as well. So we've just been, it's been kind of set aside for now. But I agree, if we can get stuff done and get it in the budget, that's great too. Thank you, Diane. Susan Kennard. On the ambulance utility fee, Angie, is there any cap on that? Can that just be raised at any time to any level? Or again, is that part of having to have a rate study? Yes, it has to be based on a rate study. So that was, um, since we did, did our last one that was completed in 2017, we've had some substantial changes in our EMS funding mechanisms. We get a new funding source called GEMT, um, which provides more of a cost reimbursement. But on the other side, we've are, we've hired additional people. We've had raises that have been part of the collective bargaining agreement. So that data only runs through 2021. And um, so that was why we asked council to get a new one done so that we have a forecast for the next five years. And it'll be similar to the one that they did last time where it has staffing models and how much it would cost to hire this many staff members. And it would give you the numbers for five years out. So it's a great preparation document to help us be able to tell the citizens exactly what those numbers would look like and what we would need. So, yeah. 
Richard Wheels. And this is a little bit perhaps of a simplistic question, uh, but it's about paying for the convention center. So the city is going to pay for the use of this room this afternoon, but the city owns the convention center. So I kind of have a fuzzy understanding of why the city has to pay, but can you clarify that? And, 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 and uh, is it more than just having the right, you know, the right uh, button in the right hole? Uh, or is there a legal basis for why the city has to pay to use the convention city that the city owns? Diane, do you want to take that one? <laughs> no. <laughs> so, I, I don't really know the history on why um, it's been done since I've been here, but um, basically we pay for the convention center out of the general fund and we write a check that goes into the convention center's um, convention center fund. So it is a, we are using the facility, we charge everybody else to use the facility. So it's basically moving money from general fund to convention center, but it's just a use fee that we charge everybody else. So we also charge ourselves uh, because they also have a budget that they have to manage and um, bring revenue in to fund operations of, as you see, the staff here and setting up and doing things, so. Yeah, I think it is like a budget line item. Like the commitment center pays part of the finance and salaries to do our billing and our invoicing, even though we're part of the city. We pay public works when they come over for our festivals and do the sand and sawdust stuff and things like that. So the money just moves from one department to another both ways back and forth so that the funds stay clean. We have to pay our fair share. We pay utilities too, <laughs> so we don't we don't not have to pay the bills. So a, a parallel question: You mentioned the interfund loans, uh, and in my mind, it's kind of like uh, I'm I'm borrowing from my my personal budget. I'm borrowing from my guest account to pay for my uh, utility bill that I, I use more water than I anticipated. Uh, so is it just simply to, to make sure that everybody knows where all of the money is specifically being spent? Uh, um, is that why we do such detailed accounting on interphone loans and paybacks? Well, um, Steve can attest to this because this is one of those difficult conversations I had with him back before I was here. Basically, one fund can't benefit another. So if you're using water money to pay for something in the general fund, that's illegal. Um, unless you do an interfund loan, which is required to be adopted by council, and it has to have a set amortization schedule, um, yearly payment plan, an interest rate attached to it, so that you're not using your water rates from customers to fund general government functions. You can't do that. You can do a loan, but you have to pay it back with interest. Um, but like I was mentioning before, that's specific for every fund except the general fund. The general fund can do, you can do whatever you want with it. So if we want to use, take the general fund money and we just put 200,000 into Storm to do the Oyhut Ditch project, we don't have to do any kind of interfund loan for that. That's totally legal, but you can't do the reverse. So we can't take EMS money and pay for police or can't take water money and pay for the library. Um, if you do, you have to make a loan and you have to pay it back with interest. So what I'm understanding is part of the reason for the detail accounting is just so that the city has, has a, a full knowledge of where did the money go. Well, it's the law. <laughs> so it's, yeah, you have to do that to comply with the law. So luckily, we haven't done any interfund loans. It's kind of a taboo thing out here because we used to have quite a few back in the day. Um, I know even the convention center had some and it, you know some of our utilities had some. But um, it's kind of a last resort. If, and if your fund is really hurting and in the negative and you have no funding source for it, um, that's kind of a dire situation where you have to borrow the money and then pay it back when you can. So. And if I could just add on to that, because I was on the, on the council that we came in with a lot of interfund loans. Um, one of the things that happened, the economy started to crater. So the 
city made decisions to keep things flowing was that maybe they should have shut it, shut some things down. They used Interfund. Well, so it didn't look like that they were as bad financially as they actually were. And so the council um, made the decision to one, be aggressive of paying things down, but also really take the policy of not doing Interfund loans and making each one stand by itself. So like the EMS one, used to have money coming out of general fund, but we moved it over to a standalone fund and made sure that the, the money that we're bringing in um, made it whole. You know, so, and, and that's something that's important to me as mayor, that, that I want the different departments to stand on their own so we do not ever get back into that financial difficulty that the city of Ocean Shores has. Angie, this is a question about the audit that just took place. And you said that there was a clean audit, and yet there were recommendations and a management letter that was issued, and the city has taken action. So how does that work if it's clean when that is there? And then I have a follow-up. Um, every audit has recommendations. Um, there's always room for improvement everywhere. So it's just a matter of <coughs> auditors have different levels of reporting. And the highest level, which is the most, um, I could say, getting an F on a paper at school, is called an audit finding. Those get reported in the audit reports. They get posted. Um, they usually get news releases on them and everything because they're big deals. It's, the findings are a big deal. When we say we got a clean audit, it means we did not have any audit findings. So we didn't get an F on the paper at school. Um, there are always recommendations. Um, in this case, it was relating to some of our contract management and um, purchases, which we're working on. But um, we did not have any audit findings, which means it was a clean audit. Okay. So we got recommendations. Thank you. And then the other question was pertaining to that on the uh, financial information that through the provisions of the lease that uh, Mr. Zander was provided, was supposed to give to the city and had not done so. And is there some reason why that never happened? I think it was a breakdown in communication, to be honest. Um, what we've done, we sat down with Mr. Zander um, once we found out the audit results and just came up with a better streamlined system. Um, he was sending stuff in paper form to me. That he was sending stuff to the city clerk. Um, so basically, we s just said, let's have one point of contact that's due the 15th of every month, and it goes to the city clerk's office. So I think it was just a matter of having a better process to make sure it wasn't falling through the cracks. And now we have calendar reminders set up. And if we don't get it by the 15th, he gets a, hey, you need to submit your report. So. There's just better processes in place and more oversight, I would say, to make sure we're getting those. And no, no requirement for providing anything from the past? We have it all. So okay. he ended up getting us what we um, needed. It just wasn't timely, so it wasn't by the 15th of each month. Understood. Thank you. Yeah. And, and just to add on, on audits, one of the things that, as mayor, that's important to me is that we always improve on stuff. And, you know, the, um, I've been audited in my I've been, you know, city's been audited, beauty's been audited, everyone's been audited, and it's never a uh, enjoyable thing, and it's also, to me, it's a little bit weird when you're on government side that not only do you get the honor of being audited on an ongoing basis, but you have the privilege of paying for it. Um, <laughs> but um, what I've charged all of, anyone that works for the city is just make our processes better. You know, the part of the problem we had is that we, it was, Kurt was on a, a basically a paper process, which you know paper gets lost, you know, and where are the stuff now that we're on electronic. Um, we didn't have a system on our calendars of when do you do the reporting. Um, and so we're all about, you know, if there's things that we need to work on, that we'll work on them. And I, I, I applaud uh, Angie and her team. Did a great job of, you know, when she brought it to me, okay, so what's the plan? And delivered a plan. And then, as you can see, we had, as soon as we got done with the audit, we had Kurt at the last council meeting. So um, we take it very seriously. We're all about improving process. 
and electronically things have improved dramatically from when when it used to be. So um, I'm glad that Angie had the had the plan of attack, and then we're going to follow through with that. Yeah, I have, I have a question on the bonds. So let's just say we go out for a hundred million dollar bond, and it's a ten year bond. I'm just using this number. Ten year bond, hundred million dollar. <laughs> Does that bond become due in 10 years? Or are the payments made on that bond over the course of the 10 years? And who makes those payments? And does it ultimately fall to the taxpayer? Sure. <laughs> okay. So it depends what secure it is for the bond, whether it's voted or not voted. Say it's not voted. So uh, typically, if it's a 10 year bond financing, you're making payments semi annually and principal payments annually. And so most bonds are structured as what we call a mortgage style structure with level payments, principal and interest over the life of the bond. They don't have to be. They could be issued to wrap around, you know, payments that are going to be expiring for old bonds and, and the like. But typically, most municipalities are conservative and, and pay off principal in addition to interest throughout the life of the bond. And I would say too, when we go through all of the the fund bond documents that are about this thick, uh, you have to have a method of paying them. For example, the convention center is paid through the PFD sales tax and LTAC. So you have to have, they're gonna, they want to know how you're going to pay for it. So when we go through that process, we figure out where it's coming from. Is it general fund? Is it, you know, taxes? Is it, if we do a voted bond, is it property taxes? So that's kind of part of the process as we go through it to figure out. We have to, be able to pay for it and they're going to want to know how so <laughs> it's all part of it I understood when you have the super majority at the for the vote of what it's a in um, for like a levy, and that, that that gives you, as I understood it, it gives you the benefit that as, so the levy is adjusted down, and so then the extra money that comes in goes towards paying the bond off sooner. Did I understand that right? Could you explain that? Right. Now? So <laughs> if the city decides to go to the voters for a voted bond issue, you have to get this minimum 60% requirement for 40% turnout. If you go to the voters, number of different specific dates throughout the calendar. You cannot go to the voters more than twice in the calendar year for the same project. But if the voters approve it, and then the council issues a bond ordinance that would actually formally authorize the bond after that, then uh, once that bond issue is closed, then because it's voted, that authorizes the bond, but it also authorizes the property tax excess levy to pay the principal interest on the bond for whatever term the bonds were issued for. So that levy would be levied similar to the city's normal annual property tax levy. But it's called an excess levy because it can only be used for the bond issue, to pay off the debt service on the bond. School districts are the main you know, issuer of voted bonds in, in Washington State. Um, and they issue a, a lot of voted bonds. Um, and they have larger excess levies than most cities do. I can give kind of an example. Um, we just paid off our big sewer bond. And each year when we do our property taxes um, with city council, we request the amount required to pay the principal and interest on the bonds. So that's what property taxes we bring in is to pay the principal and interest. And then uh, sometimes there's a little bit extra in there or a little not enough and we just that just sits in the fund until the bond is done and then in the past we've moved it for the sewer bond it'll go the money will go into the sewer fund so uh, basically we request what we need to pay the debt and we don't ask for extra annually so and that all runs through council when we do our property taxes each year thank you so this question is just an opinion school bond failed our superintendent was quoted as saying it's because we have poor retired on fixed income 
there was a message that was clearly sent out when that bond failed. As you're looking to the future, are you bearing that in mind when you're thinking about asking us, the taxpayers, for higher fees or additional taxes? Thank you. Uh, certainly, and that's one of the reasons why we're having this meeting today. Um, because I don't have any intention of asking for a bond without having a lot of conversation with the citizens of number one, why do we want to do it, get people's input. Um, I disagree with the statement that you, that you made because I think that we've got great people here and I think that um, they are more than willing to vote for something that makes sense to them. And, and, it's, and it's my responsibility as the mayor to make sure that whatever I bring forward makes sense. Um, I don't know whether or not you're in the support of police station or the South Fire Station, but uh, we are going to have plenty of conversation with the council, plenty of conversation with you before we go forward. And I think the police and fire, I started talking about it, I think within a couple of weeks that I was, was mayor. So I don't want to surprise anybody about anything. Now, I would, just for my own personal opinion, that um, I think that part of the, the school bond issue was a lack of communication prior to putting it up on, on the bond. Um, because I, I didn't know what was in that bond until I saw the signs up. You know, so I, will, I, as mayor, am not going to do that. I mean, so we'll know well in advance whether or not this makes sense for us to move forward. But, that, that's my opinion right now. The council is the one that is going to be the ones that are going to make the determination whether we move forward or not. So I really don't get to vote on that. So it's going to be those seven people that will give me direction of whichever, whichever way that we go. Okay. Are there any other questions? You've been pretty quiet. I'm sure you have some thoughts. Well, well, I do the other things, uh, yeah, and obviously I'll come back to the bond issue, but I'll just start with um, being the city administrator sometimes. It's a very strange job because there's lots of different things you have to do. Uh, I mean, today alone, I've worked on legal issues, I've worked on insurance issues, uh, we, we've had staffing and HR things we've had to deal with. We've got eight projects, major projects, that public works that are all going forward. Uh, I had to review a contract today, I've got to go over lease assignments, I've got to administer departments, but the one thing that makes this job great right now for me is that I'm in a city that's doing financially really well. Because if you're in a city that's not financially well, being a city administrator is a really hard job. You're telling people you have to lay them off, you're telling people you have to reduce hours, you have to cut projects, you have to do things. So I absolutely love the fact that I get to come in and work with Angie every day. I just want to say to everyone out there who doesn't know her, she has tremendous judgment. She's a pleasure to work with. She's extremely knowledgeable. She has loyal staff in the back there uh, that, that came in to see her. And so uh, she just makes my life a lot easier. And I just want to give her uh, you know, my praise to all of you and let you know how much she's appreciated by us. I guess I'll stay for six more years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, I echo um, what Scott said about Andy, that uh, um, becoming mayor was all of a sudden thing, big decisions had to be made. And Angie, and and part of that, you know, that uh, um, I work with Steve, you know, that they are great at at boiling things down to make a person like me understand of how the numbers work, um, and that's so important. Because I was, I don't know how many people were here, but I was here when Ocean Shores was rock bottom bottom on, on finance, and it went from they were spending money on everything to all of a sudden they weren't spending money on anything because they had had nothing. And I never want to be back back at that point. Um, so um, I, I applaud Angie and Steve, the job they did of turning the city around and making financial decisions that have, have really helped us. And I talked to other mayors and I, and I looked at our financial position versus them. You know, and, and they'll point, oh, well, you got all this growth, so you got lucky. And I would say that, no, we didn't get lucky. I mean, that happened, but if the council and the mayor and the finance directors hadn't really put it together, then we could have been one of the first cities to go bankrupt. Um, so I never wanted to go back there, but I think there's some things that we need to look for the future. It's going to cost us money. But again, you guys are all going to be part of that conversation. So if there's no other questions, I guess that's 
that's the show. All right, thank you. Thanks, everyone.